Approximately 14 months following Custer's last charge at the Little Big Horn, while our unit was stationed at Tongue River, I was assigned to a scouting detail into the Big Horn region. Our mission also involved escorting a few officers who wanted to visit the battlefield where Custer and his men met their fate. Opinions vary on the distance from Tongue River, situated near the mountains, to the battlefield. Some claim it's no more than 25 miles, while others suggest 30, with none estimating it beyond 35. However, after a grueling two-day ride from the head of the Little Horn in the mountains, a point closer than Tongue River, now General Miles' headquarters, we carefully calculated the distance to be at least 45 miles. Starting from the elevated plateau where we stood, the terrain gradually sloped downward toward the river, becoming as flat as a floor, with distinct boundaries marked by sparsely wooded streams and bluffs on both sides. Across the water we could see the rugged embankment stretching from the south, where Reno's force was positioned while Custer and his men faced peril, to the northern horizon, standing nearly vertical, except for occasional breaks where small streams joined the Little Horn or where access to fords was possible, which we would need to traverse to reach the opposite side. Further back toward the Rosebud, the quiet, treeless, sandy wolf mountains rose tall, casting a gentle and pleasant shadow over the landscape. At the opposite end of the valley, the rolling hills, lush with greenery and adorned with colorful flowers in full bloom, completed a scene as beautiful as any artist's eye has ever beheld or a master's hand has ever captured on canvas. After a long and tiring journey, marked by the typical incidents that can lift or dampen the spirits of both man and beast, we finally reached and entered the location of the old Indian village. It was situated alongside the river, on a sunken plateau with sparse tree cover. The village stretched about four miles in length and half a mile in width. The once dense timber that covered the bottomland had been largely cleared by the squaws, who harvested the bark to feed their ponies during the winter months, leaving much of the central area nearly barren. On the southern side, we traversed a thick, bushy grove, spanning three or four acres, where the squaws and children hid as Custer's forces approached, remaining concealed until the cavalry were securely trapped. Beyond this, the terrain presented a peculiar sight. Teepee and lodge poles were densely packed, surrounded by scattered camp equipment and hides in disarray. One notable observation was the abundance of discarded leggings strewn around, suggesting that the Indians had replaced them with clothing taken from the deceased soldiers. Further along, we encountered six burial scaffolds, beneath which lay the remains of as many Indians. One skull still contained a rifle bullet indicating a fatal wound. It was almost dark by the time we arrived at the lower ford, situated halfway through the deserted Indian village. We decided to camp there for the night, feeling wet, cold, hungry, and thoroughly exhausted. After quickly preparing supper, we ate and took a short smoke before spreading our damp blankets on the ground to rest. However, sleep was elusive as the incessant howling of coyotes and wolves filled the air, seemingly upset at being deprived of their usual nightly scavenging for food scraps among scattered bones. We had been lying down for some time when a sudden yell pierced the silence. Startling Jack Healy awake, he jumped to his feet, shouting snakes. The warning cry of snakes was prompted by Jack, who was barely conscious, feeling a chilly, slimy sensation creep across his face. We quickly got up, added more wood to the dying fire, and armed with sabers, began searching for the unwelcome intruders. Despite finding no snakes, we discovered countless lizards, slimy green creatures, and wasted no time in dispatching them until not a single one remained alive. However, the fear of another attack by these repulsive creatures prevented us from getting any sleep. Soon another man felt a lizard crawling over him, prompting everyone to rise again and engage in another round of lizard hunting. Sleep became impossible. We remained awake, sitting or lying around, until morning finally arrived. After a hurried breakfast, we proceeded over the battlefield, where just over a year ago, General George A. Custer and his 300 brave troopers of the 7th Cavalry were massacred by between three and 4,000 Indian warriors under the direct command of Sitting Bull. None of the perpetrators of that massacre have ever been held accountable for their horrendous actions. What's worse, 
some of these very same individuals are now being supported by the government they once fought against and are compelled to interact with members of the Seventh Cavalry. The bodies of our fallen comrades have never been laid to rest properly. Despite the passing of many months, this small group of courageous individuals, whose heroic actions will forever be etched in history, have yet to receive a dignified burial. Their remains, stripped of clothing by the heartless and merciless savages and picked clean by wolves and other predators, lie scattered on the ground where they met their tragic fate. A somber reminder of Major Reno's failure to provide the expected support. Two days following the battle, a small group was dispatched to bury the fallen, yet not one received a proper farewell. Graves were shallow, and the scant dirt hastily thrown over them was quickly eroded by rains or dug up by scavenging animals and birds. Crossing the Little Horn, now named the Custer River, to its eastern bank, a clearly marked path ascends a gentle slope for about a quarter of a mile. The terrain is covered with sagebrush, coarse grass, and prickly pear, devoid of rocks or trees. Upon reaching the crest, we observe a ravine with gently sloping sides, nearly half a mile in length, devoid of any sheltering features. Nearby lie the uncovered remains of 18 men, arranged in six piles, each marked with a piece of TP pole. One of these makeshift tombstones bears a white sombrero, a memento of a 7th Cavalry member, pierced by two bullet holes and a deep gash, presumably inflicted by an axe wielded by squaws in their frenzied attack on the wounded and deceased of Custer's unit. Nearby lay the discarded bodies of two horses. A short distance northward, heaps of intermingled bones obscured the exact count of individuals represented. Further along, another pile of bones accompanied by the skeleton of a horse suggested the grim use of the animal as a makeshift barricade. A well-worn path winds along the ridge, dividing the river from the ravine, and it was littered with bleached bones, decaying gear, and clothing. About 300 yards up the trail, we reached the knoll where Custer and the remaining soldiers made their last stand. We imagine him calmly reloading and firing alongside his men, often checking the bluffs to see if Reno, whom he had urgently asked for support, was approaching. Reno's complete failure to answer the call for help is widely criticized. This elevated spot on the battlefield sits just above the ridge it marks the end of and seems like a strategic position. However, the enemy outnumbered the small group of soldiers stationed there. At the top of the hill where Custer fell, we observed the remains of four men and horses including the skeleton of Custer's own horse. We made our way back to Tongue River, the haunting image of that battlefield etched in our memories, pondering whether Custer and his men could have been saved if Reno had attempted to come to their aid. Trumpeter Martin, also known as John Martin or Giovanni Martini, insists Reno could have reached them. He knows this firsthand, as he was the man Custer sent back to urge Reno to hurry to his assistance. Note, Mulford's account contains several inaccuracies. Firstly, it was not Reno's duty to support Custer, but rather the opposite. Secondly, John Martin's eyewitness testimonies from 1908, 1910, and 1922 do not suggest any charge or expectation that Reno could or should have left his defensive position in the bluffs to attempt to rescue Custer. Reno had lost nearly half of his command, either dead or missing, within 15 minutes, and he was outnumbered at least 10 to 1, according to Custer's own intelligence estimate before the battle. Reno was in no position to rescue anyone and was very close to suffering the same fate as his commanding officer. White Man Runs Him stated that the Sioux would have killed Reno and all his men if Frederick Benteen hadn't arrived at the critical moment. 